Joining us to weigh in on a range of topics, we have Jamie Rogozinski. He is the founder of Wall Street Bets, a uh, Reddit that you guys probably know yes. about. We covered it quite a bit last year with GameStock um, back in 2012, and he also is the author of a book on that same topic. Great to meet you, Jamie. Good to see you, Jamie. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> of course. Um, so we wanted to start with a, an item that's in the news that I thought would be interesting to get your thoughts on. Let's go ahead and throw this tear sheet up on the screen. Um, Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks founder, who of course is being uh, prosecuted by the U.S. government right now in an attempted extradition back to the U.S. to face prosecution here. Um, supporters of him just raised $56 million dollars to buy an NFT, they did this through what is called a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. You know, for people who aren't like native to this language, can you just explain what a DAO is, what they did, what they did with the money, and what's going to happen now so people can understand the significance of all of this? Yeah, I mean, first of all, NFTs and DAOs, all these different things, they have a definition, they all stand for something, right? But that's sometimes not enough to fully explain it because the definitions aren't fully clear. Mm -hmm. NFTs are very frequently related to pictures or artwork or, you know, d different pieces of content that somebody creates. But NFTs and DAOs, which are starting to kind of uh, intermingle with the same concept, they're, they're, they're blurry. So what happened here with Julian Assange was to create this uh, community, uh, which he arguably probably already had given how much he raised, they came together with a common cause and said, hey, let's purchase this NFT, this this non-fungible token, a picture, an image. I haven't actually seen what, what the content of it is, but with a stated purpose of helping him out with his legal fees. In other words, it's kind of like a crowdfunding uh, exercise for them, right? The, the idea of DAO is a concept where instead of having like a company with a president and he tells everybody what to do or a board of directors, you have a community that comes together and they all vote on what they want to do and they can mm -hmm. all vote on how they want to move forward with whatever decisions need to happen. Yeah, it's really interesting because, Jamie, when I think about it, Wall Street Bets was kind of a proto thing for a lot of what's happening in Web3. As one of the people who founded this, uh, talk to us about the evolution of that subreddit and how you watch the quote-unquote memification and kind of br br bring together of ultimately what was a decentralized community affect the stock market in the way that it did with GameStop. Yeah, I mean, effectively, the, the concept of community is probably the strongest component currently in or the, the strongest theme currently in the world of crypto, whether it be DAOs, NFT projects, tokens, currencies, whatever it might be. It's just people that come together with a common interest and they hang out and they chat, sometimes in chat rooms, sometimes on different social media, and they get excited and they learn from each other. They contribute to this particular project. Wall Street Bets was exactly that, right? It mm -hmm. starts off as people that are interested in the stock market, that are interested in taking risk, that don't have any issues with taking uh, a little bit of money and risking most of it in hopes that they can turn it into a lot of money, right? And as the, the community was established and word got out, lots of people were like, yeah, that, that sounds like me. I, I want to do this too. You know, I'm young or, or I was affected by the 2008 crisis, whatever it might be. And then, and then it just kept growing by itself organically. And this community, what they do is they literally hang out, they have fun, they find different exploits that they can try and take advantage of. Um, you know, in and, and, and finance, they call these things arbitrage or whatever it might be. In this particular world, they use memes instead of using Excel sheets, but um, it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. um, so as the stock market has been on sort of uncertain grounds lately, a lot of those meme stocks were the first to take massive hits What's your reaction to that? And also, were there any sort of like lessons learned out of what happened with GameStop? Uh, you know, the volatility is bound to happen at some point, right? The, the market's been going up since 2000. I mean, for the past 14 years or so, it's just been going up and up and up with the exception of last year. So at some point, sooner or later, we're going to have some volatility. We're starting to see a little bit of that here, whether it comes or stays, or sorry, whether it goes or stays is anybody's guess. With regards to the meme stocks, it goes, it's the same exact point, right? They have different mm -hmm. catalysts like earning calls, whatever it might be. Lessons learned really depends on what it is that we're out there to learn, right? A lot of people went out there and made money. A lot of people went out there and lost money. And, you know, explanations can 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 come up with, uh, people can come up with explanations relative to, well, it went down because Robinhood stopped trading, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it's just the market and it's got its own mindset. And sometimes it does things because of exogenous factors, endogenous factors. 
Uh, Wall Street business has largely moved on, right? Like it's not, mm-hmm. they're not going to sit there thinking about like, well, we would have done this differently. No, they're just looking for different ways to continue having fun, to continue to try and find ways to, uh, you know, to find free money in the market or find high propensity trades in the market. Yeah, I think perhaps, you know, I always understood this just from the shit posting angle of it because I grew up on the internet. Um, I try not to curse here that often, but I don't really know what else, how else you could describe it. <laughs> um, how are you trying to bring that energy to this new venture, which I know we have a little bit. We can put that on the screen. Trying to bring trading stocks um, into a more of a crypto environment, and but also obviously using uh, the energy that you found and instigated in Wall Street bets. How does that look? Because this very much looks to me like where the future is going to end up. Well, it looks very much to me the same thing, right? That's the reason why I'm mm-hmm. uh, getting involved with this. Look, at the end of the day, it's painfully apparent how powerful crypto can be. And crypto, not to be confused with the price of Bitcoin or some other coin right. or a dog coin, it's the technology, this DeFi platform, this ability to decentralize interactions uh, financial interactions. I don't say uh, transactions because sometimes they're not quite transactions, but there's interactions and it's, it's it's incredibly powerful, right? And there's a lot of efficiencies and a lot of things that, that crypto does better. So I'll give you an example. You can easily make a crypto synthetic stock or tokenized stock trade anywhere between 20 to 24 hours a day, something that normal stocks should be able to do in case Elon Musk decides to tweet on a Sunday about selling his shares, right? Right. Uh, You're able to do that now with crypto. It makes perfect sense when you see something like that happen on the weekend or China saying we're going to default, whatever. Just You can go to your computer right there and then, not wait until the market's open 24 hours later and actually take advantage of that. And and, uh, there's a lot of efficiency in terms of crowdfunding. We've seen studies that look at Wall Street bets at the post and the, the various stocks that people discuss on there, they've they've shown that on average, they can beat the S&P 500 given their collective ability to come up with different ideas. So why not bring that into crypto? Further democratizes uh, the, the financial landscape. People are all the way around the world can participate in their own way. So it's, it's obviously going to be the next big thing. And uh, I want to be a part of it. Uh-huh. So one of the critiques of crypto, because there's a lot of idealism around it, I'm an idealist myself, so I, I appreciate that, but one of the critiques is that you're just recreating like a lot of the old problems of the old system, in particular in terms of income inequality, in sort of a new form. So the vast majority of crypto is held by you know relatively small sliver of people. It's the same sort of thing where if you're like first movers advantage. So it's people who you know got in early who are most likely to benefit the most. What is your response to that particular critique? People that get in early also risk the most. Risk and return go side by side. If you hear about a project that's just about to launch or an NFT project that's just about to go, people are like, yeah, this is going to be the best thing ever. And you put a lot of money into it, but you haven't had a chance to see what the team is made of or, or, or what the launch is going to be like. That's the most. That's like buying like a pre-construction apartment or a house, right? Mm-hmm. You're paying less for it, but you don't know what you're going to get. So yes. Uh, the people that get in early can make more money. But I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that there's income inequality, right? You have that that spectrum of saying, look, you have the higher risk stuff. And if you pick any of the dog coins, you're going to risk a lot and you might make a lot of money, right? Or if you pick a stable coin like USDC or whatever it is mm-hmm. and decide to deposit it for 8% interest a year, then you're not going to lose any money. So, you know, you have you have that that spectrum there. But at the end of the day, I believe that it contributes to income equality. And so I'll give you a small example. People have been trying, and I believe they've already started to succeed at turning uh, real estate into an NFT. In other words, uh, putting putting the deed on the blockchain and actually mm-hmm. have it be recognized and selling it that way. What this allows you to do is one step away from fractionalizing it, meaning breaking it into smaller parts. Income real estate is a great investment, but it's only a great investment if you invest in the expensive properties, like the beachfront properties are the ones that are millionaire properties, and those are the ones that go up forever. But if you buy a place in the slums or in some place it's not going to be developed in the near future, it tends to stay that way, right? So even real estate is not is not fair. But if you take an NFT component and say, well, I know you can't afford the million dollar mansion or whatever, but you can afford a small percentage of it, that's that's within your reach. Then all of a sudden you've actually leveled the playing field and allowed more access to people that perhaps don't have as much money to buy into the 
good real estate. Yeah. And what's your reaction to the just m- massively pervasive fraud that we've seen with NFTs? You know, it's an unfortunate st- growing pain that, that uh, any any new concept has to go through. We saw some of that similar in the ICO in 2017-ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, where people come up there, it's relatively low cost to come up with this project and tell people, hey, come here and give me your money. You know, like just just like Assange just pulled $56 million. Right. Now, arguably, he's got a reputation and, and um, it's less likely to turn into a fraud. Uh, but it doesn't stop anybody from trying to do that. The good mm-hmm. thing is that people wise enough, there's a lot of projects where uh, where people get burned and there's a lot of projects where people don't. And then all of a sudden they start being a little bit more careful with regards to how they want to invest their money into it. But at the end of the day, sometimes they know, you know, this is going to be a pump and dump. I don't care. I'm going to go into it and I'm going to buy really low and I'm going to sell them when it's at the peak of the pump. And if they don't sell at the peak of the pump, they say, shoot, I ran out of money. Let's reload the machine. Let's pull the lever. Let's try again with another one tomorrow. And I won't be so greedy. It's the Wild West out there. Uh, Appreciate you breaking it down for us. I find it really interesting, especially, you know, kind of tying into the history of Wall Street bets. So thank you for joining us, man. Great to meet you, Jamie. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. What a week. I feel like it's been like nine years. (laughs) Weirdly, it has been the biggest week ever in Breaking Points history. I can't thank you guys enough. But it also is proof of why we do the show, both to stand up around free speech, but we didn't drop any of our coverage of some of the most important issues that were happening. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what we try to do here more than anything. Yeah, and I think both of us on Tuesday when our YouTube channel just— wasn't oh, working yeah. for a few hours. Um, and we were, you know, very frustrated. We out. And there was nothing we could do. I mean, it was just like, we tried everything on, we ruled out, and it was nothing on our end. The channel just literally wasn't working on the back end. And so we had this single point of failure. And I think it just was another validator for us of why we created the business model that yeah. we did because or, the premium subs were able to get the video. Yeah, we, we got it out on Vimeo because, at like 1130. Right, so. because for them, Luckily. it doesn't have to go on, on you know, out on YouTube. We were able to send it out on Vimeo. So you have different options. So you don't have this single point of failure. But in terms of like, you know, the free public clips and, you know, the the ads being inserted in there and all of that, there was just nothing we could do whatsoever. It was crazy, guys. I mean, we couldn't post for four straight hours and we still have no idea. YouTube doesn't even know. They're like, like, yeah, we don't know. Just started working again. Your account, and then all of a sudden we were allowed to upload. Ended up being one of our biggest days ever on YouTube. But look, I mean, maybe it would have been bigger. I, I have no idea, you know? So like you said, you have a single point of failure, then you have a point of failure ultimately. And we had a very stark reminder of that. But we didn't actually sweat it except for the people who you know can't afford a premium subscription. I felt bad for them. Yeah. But financially, it was okay. If we had relied only on them, I mean, we would have been truly screwed. It was so, really frustrating, but in yeah. the end, it all right. worked. Right, we have the backlash, <laughs> it worked out. But it only worked out because we know that we have you guys. Otherwise, I would have been tearing my hair out and yes. losing it. Oh so, my God. thank you to the, everybody who supports us on the premium membership. It's for moments like that that we literally live for you. We watch it happen before our eyes. It's happening all the time on Instagram and other internet terms of shadow banning um, and elsewhere. But again, you know, you guys are the people we rely on and you fund our work, our ability to produce the Rogan video that we did today um, so much more that we could literally just on a dime hire somebody who does extremely good work. Yeah. You know, this stuff is not cheap and all of it comes down to everybody. So thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Love you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you here next week.
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.